Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. So they, they start in flea markets, flea markets for beer cans, cookies, you know, uh, you know, then, you know, St. Louis, law school, knitting factory, okay, uh, seders, what, what, what kind of, and then the idea of wine and a concert venue, fine food. Who does this? There's one guy who's creative. His name is Michael Dorff. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. You're from the Midwest. So tell me about uh, the grandparents. Well, several generations of uh, Dorffs, and, and on my mom's side, they all seem to come to Chicago. Okay, so, and so how they, the Russian Jews? Russian Polish. Russian Little Polish. German. Yeah. Oh, so they had yeah. a little German. Just a little bit. Okay, and they end up. So that Chicago. borderline between Poland, you know, moved around a lot. So, so they end up in Chicago originally? Yes. And how they decide that Chicago, they should go to Milwaukee? My grandfather, Sal, was wanting to start his own business, so he was doing something similar in Chicago for what, another. Company. What was he doing in Chicago? A grocery food distribution, and then he started a cookie and biscuit business in Milwaukee called so Milwaukee he, Biscuit Company. So that's Grandpa Sal. What about your mother's side? Uh, Morris and Marie, they decided to go to Kansas City, and he got into the Schmata Laundry business. So what, what type of business in the Schmata Laundry? You know? Right. Schmatas and laundry, they, you, you You've clean got to clean, you got to clean schmatas. I, right. uh, I'm a little unclear as exactly. <laughs> okay. So, so, so we, you have Kansas City yeah. and you have Milwaukee. How does your father meet your mother? Uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, at a uh, formal dance, and they hit it off, and they've been together ever since. Now, you know, you, you tell me about, Grandpa Saw has a lot to do in your, in your career over there. Tell me about Grandpa Saw. He was a classic entrepreneur. Uh, he, he grew a business from scratch. There's some great photos of him where he looks kind of like Al Capone, and there's some funny stories about before he started the business in Chicago. And uh, he dressed well and uh, met my grandma on a, on a Boat you sure he had dancing. nothing to do with Mayor Lansky, you know, uh, on that side? I don't think so, but, you know, he, he stayed fit, lived to be 93, and, and every, every day at 5.30 at happy hour with my grandma, and he'd have a, a nice scotch. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was a real character. So, so Grandpa Saul starts in the biscuit business, and then he goes more into other types of food, right? Yeah, well, my dad took the business and expanded it to about 5,000 different products over time, some health foods and kosher foods and 
He was the first uh, Midwest importer of Evian water in the 70s. So really expanded the business, ended up it being a very large business and sold to a Dutch company. Grandpa Saul and your dad were running this business and you were selling the food to supermarkets? Or? Yeah, he was a distributor so it would go to, to retail, to supermarkets and grocery stores. So now you, you're a kid, uh, you're born in Milwaukee. Yep. And um, so tell me about uh, your youth before you get to 12 years of age, because I'll get to the 12 years of age. Tell me about the, the early years. Well, I Living well, in grew in the, up in the, in the suburbs. The backyard, when I was really young, was connected to truly farmland that then turned into homes. I mean, it was really on the borderline in Wisconsin. No cow tipping or anything like that, but typical. Did, did you ever uh, milk a cow? I mean, I did once, but it was a school trip, you know. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> But I, I got into, uh, you know, traded baseball cards and collected, you know, just typical stuff. And so talk about trading, you know. Uh, I, I thought there were only flea markets in New York and New Jersey. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that. No, there's uh, a they, huge, huge flea market between Milwaukee and Chicago called Seven Mile Fair. And uh, with a friend of mine, Todd, we combined, we merged our beer can collections. You know, it was a, it was a major, you know, merger. Absolute ribbon. All those, you know, Milwaukee's the, you know, beers that made right. Milwaukee famous, right? So Miller Highlight and the there's a lot in Line and Kugel, a lot of really cool collectibles, and you could go out and find them and trade them, and it became a real, real business. And then one day we just said, let's sell it. So we went. My parents drove me to Seven Mile Fair, and we put our beer cans out, and we came home that day with three hundred and fifty dollars, and my. My folks, and more importantly, I think my friend Todd and I, we were like, wow, you can, you can make some money. So uh, about a year later, I convinced my dad to... Now you're 12, right? Yeah, well, it was 12, 13, and when I was 14, convinced my, my folks to give me uh, some, some package cookies. They were small boxes of cookies. They were three for a dollar is what they were retailing for. Okay, three packages. Three packages for a dollar. Okay, and a couple of cookies in a package. Right? Yeah, I mean, it was actually, it was a value then. And uh, so we, he dropped us off in a station wagon with uh, I don't know, 15, 20 cases of cookies. And we, we took a little stand and we got a card table and we were there next to the guy selling Bic pens and on the, on the left, uh, you know, car batteries. I mean, it's a flea market. And, uh, no beer cans. Just no beer cans. We, we, we were done. We liquidated that business. And then um, uh, we, 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 hadn't, we hadn't really sold many cookies. And at about 2 o'clock, I, with a dime, called my dad and said, uh, you know, it's not going well. You know, but by the way, you know, we sat on one box the whole time, and so we've crushed them. And uh, what should we do? And he goes, just sell those for cheaper. I don't want to bring back the, the crushed cookies, the broken cookies. So we opened it up and we started going five for a dollar, five for a dollar, and uh, that box went very quickly, that case. So we broke all the rest of the cookies and sold everything for five for a dollar. So when my father picked us up at five, he was like, I thought we were taking back most of the stuff. And he goes, I said, no, you know, they, they broke, you know, by accident and we, you know, we sold everything out. And then we realized that all, all I got to do is break the cookies. They're the same goods. So we, we, we looked at what my dad was doing, and, and I knew there was a lot of damaged product in, in his warehouse, and I asked if I could bring that next time. And so for... So you're the king of damaged cookies. So it was damaged goods, it was dented cans, it was broken boxes of pretzels, it was frozen olive oil that like was a little discolored. And it, but it, when I was 16, I finally was able to drive, and I was filling up a truck, and so you had more than one table. Oh, by, by the end, I had a big stand, lots of tables, you know. Did you have the Dorf sign on this? Or? <laughs> it, almost. I mean, we, we, we had a big Milwaukee biscuit truck, so people knew that, you know, the product was real. And, uh, you know, at the end, I would get there. You have to get a stand at 5 in the morning, and I would basically be, in, be asleep because, you know, I was a, a, a punk. And uh, I had some great customers, regulars, that would open up the thing, pull the food out for me, fill up their, their you know, cases, and then just tell me what it was. Now, now what, what also happened was you were helping your, your buddies because you, you employed them. They I, were working. Yeah, I had a couple of friends that we split the money, and then uh, eventually my cousins uh, kind of took over the, the business, and by the time I was in college, they were still doing it. And then there were certainly some times when I started the knitting factory, I wish... I was making some money the way I did at Seven Mile Fair because that was good cash. So you, 
you, you, you graduate, now you're, not, uh, you're a, a biscuit food entrepreneur, dented cans and everything else. You graduate and you decide that uh, Milwaukee is not the place for you. You want to go to college. Uh, I went to the Washington University in St. Louis. Okay, so what do you go to Wash U for? I, uh, I wanted to get into the architecture program and uh, I submitted my portfolio. When I, did you get interested in architecture? I just, that's, I'm in high school. I've always liked building. I, I, I love building now, but I've always liked buildings. Uh, what, um, was it from a wreck set? You know, from, no, from like tree houses. I, I built a really great tree house uh, when I was pre-bar mitzvah, and uh, then I started doing rec rooms and, and, uh, and stuff in, college, in, in high school. But didn't get into the architecture program. But they saw that I, I had some some business sense, so they they suggested the business school. So I got into the business school. And then when I was in the business school, I was less interested in the way they were teaching business, and I wanted to get an arts, uh, you know, liberal arts degree. So I got a psychology degree as well. But they didn't allow the uh, double major in the, uh, with the business school. They just just Washington University didn't allow it. So I did it under a different name. I was Michael Ethendorf in the liberal arts school and then Michael Dorf in the uh, business so school. So you got two you got, got two different degrees. Two different degrees. Now, th since you were an entrepreneur as a kid, what, what were you doing when you were going to college as an entrepreneur? Uh, a few things. I mean, a actually, my parents would sell, send me uh, 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 food kits and, uh, I, I, you know, spices and stuff. I you know, ended up selling those in the dorms. Then one year I brought back some stuff that I would have uh, some better spices that would have gone into the, uh, to Seven Mile Fair. I remember bringing those back a couple times and selling those. What about the summers? Did you go I, back to I, the I flea did, market? I did, I did some rec rooms. I did some more building and occasional flea market, but it was more uh, the the rec room. I was building rec rooms at that point. So now you know the, the rec room guy, the handyman, the flea market guy. You graduate, wash you, and how, how did you decide that you wanted to become a lawyer? Well, I, was, I didn't think I wanted to be a lawyer. I knew I wanted to get into entertainment. So I thought intellectual property rights might be the direction. But I took a year off between college and, and going to law school, so went what, to Europe traveling. Went to Europe traveling. Yeah. Barcelona? I lived in Barcelona on a language program for a little while. That was one way to rationalize did, did you, getting some in, money. In, in Barcelona and in Europe, did you... Uh, indulge in a lot of wine? I, I enjoyed my, my share of wine and was starting to get more and more into wine. In Spain they have a thing called Menu del Dia and for about two dollars, it was a hundred pesetas or what have you at the time, it was all the wine you could drink and so learned a lot uh, about Rioja for sure there. Um, and also the arts. I mean I would say I was in, indulging in, in learning about the arts and, and especially in somewhere like Barcelona between Picasso and Miro and Gaudi. I mean it's a it's a incredible place. So, so you have this year off okay and then you uh, you go to law you, you I went back and, and went to law school but part of why I went back to Madison and, and was drawn back was there was a band called Swamp Thing which were my friends uh, from 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 high school and uh, what kind of band was Swamp Thing? Swamp Thing was a, a great pop rock silly band. Um, phenomenal sense of humor. And uh, actually, they were being managed while I was in Spain by Richard Lovett, who's currently head of CAA. Um, and uh, I took over from him. So pretty good uh, management. Uh, uh, so so you really went back to, 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 to Milwaukee to... To go to law school? To Madison, yeah. To go back to law school and manage this band. Right. That was really my purpose. And I was, I was very interested in entertainment law and thought that if there was something within the law world, this would be something I would do. And what about the sticks? Do you remember the exact well, sticks? Yeah, when I came back from Spain, I, I certainly had some, some uh, artistic uh, inklings. Um, uh, and so I made some sculpture while going back to Washington University for about a month to be with my, what is now my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time. And, it, and St. Louis in May is a nice place to be. It gets a little hot in June, but May is great. So I went back for, to see some of my friends, and I started making some sculpture out of two-by-fours and, 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 and wood. And the first one I made, I just put out on the lawn, and someone drove by and asked if it was for sale. 
And I, of course, said yes. Um, and uh, I think uh, 10 bucks. And then I, I made another one the next day. And I ended up making five of them and selling them all. So I'm, I've only, uh, I'm a, a very uh, a successful sculptor in that I, I've made five and sold five. Now, you're, you're at law school, and then what happens? You decide to change law school? Well, after, uh, towards the end of the year, I, 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 Wisconsin didn't have a huge entertainment program, and uh, I, I really wanted to, to, to get either into it or start w really working in the music business. So I, I committed to either going to NYU um, or stay in New York. And my, 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 my now wife, girlfriend, went, was going to NYU uh, film school, and so I was like, "This is what you know, this is it. I'm going to New York." So you moved One, to New York and did and not get did not get NYU, and basically you still have the swamp. Group, and right? so I'm managing the band, and we I put out their first record on a on a on cooperative what was it called? Flaming, on Pie Flaming Pie Records. Pie. Yeah, and uh, and borrowed some money from my grandfather. Grandpa he, saw you you borrow ten thousand yeah. dollars plus you had your bar mitzvah money. Yeah, well right? I had I wasn't using that yet. I was using that. I was going to use that for so, to so start. The, to so Grandpa saw was the initial he, help. He helped, and I was not not doing well. Um, you could make a lot of records, but I wasn't collecting the money from the stores. Were these um, 78s, 45s? They're, no, they were 33 LPs. Um, we made one 45. And I put out a couple other Wisconsin bands, Phil Gnarly and the Tough Guys, and a band called Honor Among Thieves. All three were from Madison. And was trying to do this out of my 10th Street apartment. I had rented an apartment. Uh, and, and having fun, but not, not surviving in New York. And I was going through the money. And, and I, I was close to coming back to Wisconsin with my tail between my legs. Right, but at this time, Pop was thinking of selling the business. So you it was still, it was, that was a little, a little bit next, but they were debating. The, the third generation, we, we kind of were told and we came to, we're not interested and we, we're not going to go into the food distribution business. So we're all going to go off and do our, our own thing. And uh, I, I, I was really close to, you know, leaving New York because I wasn't sure how to make any money. And then I conven convinced a good friend of mine, Louis, who, Lou Spitzer, who I was doing the rec rooms with, to come out to New York and let's build a cafe. And I found... Oh, you could have been, you know, you could have been building buildings in New York at this time. I, you know, yeah. you need some okay. capital. Okay. So, so Louis and you come some out... Some of your other guests had I met them, right. maybe, you know. So you go out there, you and Lou, what do you do? I, I, so I rent for $1,800 a month, 4070s House and Street, uh, and it was an Avon office. And we, we basically gutted it ourselves. I don't know what we did with the material. What, what was this? What, what it was we, an Avon office. I know it was an Avon office, but what were you going to use it for? So I wanted to put together a, a live music cafe and, and be able to use the, the band's uh, PA system that was in my apartment. And, and try and what about zoning and as of right? You know what you, know, what you could do. Houston Street between Mont and Mulberry in 1986 when we took the lease. Um, uh, it didn't matter. How, how did you decide the knitting factory? Uh, there was a uh, uh, a wear uh, a sweater manufacturer in Milwaukee um, called Bloodstains, um, and one of the band members worked there, and they used to joke around and call it Mr. Bloodstains Knitting Factory, and the second record of the band was going to be called uh, Mr. Bloodstein's Knitting Factory. We ended up calling the record A Cow Comes True, but that name had stuck with me. So the first name I had for the corporation of what this new entity was going to be was called the Fire Escape. The problem, and because we had a huge fire escape right across the front window. But when I started talking to some friends, I said, I'm opening up this music joint and cafe called the Fire Escape. They're all like, that's not a really good name for a New York, you know, place where you want to feel safe. Um, and so right at the last minute, I called it the Knitting Factory. And I, and, and I promised the so band... So tell me about the Knitting Factory at the beginning. You, you were producing music, and you had a relationship with some record, uh, radio station streaming music, and also TDK. Correct? certainly wasn't streaming. In, you know, uh, it wasn't what we would call uh, streaming, right? Well, it, was, so it was record. You know. So I always wanted to, you know, we had this record business, and I was still operating that out of the office in the back, and I was living in the office in the back as well. I had a futon under the desk. I would go to uh, Pineapple Fitness on the corner of Houston and, and, and Broadway, to shower, so for thirty-nine dollars a month, I had a membership, and that's where I, 
I had running water and occasionally took a steam. I never worked out, um, but uh, it was it was a crazy existence. And I was basically I wanted to be in the record business. We had these really interesting live shows starting to happen. Great artists, John Zorn and Bill Frizzell and Cassandra Wilson and Sonic Youth, real diverse music. And so we started recording them with permission, and the idea was a live from the Knitting Factory radio series going to the same college stations that I was trying to get the records played that I had put out. And when I, I'd be on the phone with the radio station, say, in, in Kansas or something, and I'd say, hey, would you mind playing Phil Gnarly and the Tough Guys? I sent you the record. And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, you know, I'm, I'm doing this from this new joint, um, and I just had Sonic Youth play here. And they go, oh, wow, I mean, that, that we would like to listen to. So it kind of came out of this not interested in what I was doing with the record label, very interested in what was happening. And so I convinced TDK Tapes to give me a lot of tapes, and we had this series called Live from the Knitting Factory on TDK. And we ended up having, after the second year, 250 college radio stations around the country uh, playing live from the Knitting Factory. Now, uh, knitting Factory grows. You, uh, it, it, it increases its size in New York. Then I moved to Tribeca in 94. My dad gave me a, we co-signed a loan, and it started to grow, and, and, and Tribeca started to expand around us. And uh, we probably couldn't have opened up a Knitting Factory music club where it is today or really almost anywhere in Tribeca. Uh, from knit, Knitting Factory over there, you get Knitting Factory, you go public even. Don't you get uh, backers over there? You yeah, well, it certainly didn't go public. No, no, but, but you had the P money, private equity We started money. getting some, some outside capital, and it grew, and, and I opened one in Hollywood, California in, in the year 2000, and our whole internet business was exploding because we were raising money really on what was called knit media. Right, but, but then the world died. Yes, it did. 9-11 happened. The internet crash in spring of 2000, 9-11, and then the entire demise of the recorded music business all within a couple so, of years. So now it's 2002, and you, you leave the knitting factory. Yeah. And um, what happens? What, what you? My brother called me. He was living in San Francisco and said, his friend David Tate, who works at Ridge uh, Winery, they make the Montebello, was um, Montebello wine. Had they had a glut of fruit that year, and he was interested in doing his own barrel. And would I buy the barrel of and the, and the grapes? And David will make the wine. And I jumped at the opportunity because I loved wine, and I, the thought from, of from those days. In, in well, Spain. I've always been drinking and, and trying wine, and going to dinners, and and taking some classes, and so, so a fan. you make some wine with you. So I made some wine. It was just a blast. And then when it was in a bottle, uh, also the label produced by a, a friend of ours, a painter in Amsterdam. So it was my brother and David Tate, the winemaker, and another friend, Jonathan from from California. And we, we, we were giving it away to our, my friends, and a lot of my friends back here in New York were, wow, I want to make a barrel of wine. You know, that sounds great. And so between 05 and 07, I got enough interest from people going, yeah, that, that's really an interesting so, so idea. How, okay, so how does the entrepreneur who's running concerts, doing other uh, great community th services, find this place on Varick Street and say, yeah, a printing place to, to make this, City winery? Well, I, I, uh, I'd i been working with a broker for a little while, Rob Frischman, and, and he connected me with Trinity Real Estate, and uh, they liked the idea, and, and they vetted me. I, I collected a little bit of friends and family. So what was the, okay, you go there, and your vision is, I'm going to take a place, I'm going to make a, a concert venue, I'm also going to have a place where people can make their own wine, Right, um, and there's going to be food. So there's the axiom, and the, there's a classic one in the wine business that it's 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 easy to make wine, it's hard to sell wine. And and I, while I was very interested in the wine making process, I needed to hire a real winemaker and and have a facility. I needed to figure out a way to to sell it in a unique way and combine it with what I like. So it was really a very selfish s thought process. I, where I want to go to a place that I could see a show in an intimate environment and, and real state-of-the-art sound and, and, and lights and sit, because my knees are starting to get bad, and, and drink wine and have a nice list in an environment that is really exciting. And to me, 
the setting of a winery and the smell and the aromas of, of fermenting grapes would be fantastic. And drink wine t in a sophisticated setting with a real glass, not a plastic cup like every other you know, venue. And so it was really the desire to combine all of that in a hospitality experience, and that's how I could sell the wine. And so the idea of really mashing it all up and having a winery right downtown and a venue within the winery and the, you know, being able to look into the winery. I mean, New York really was our, our, our where it all came together. Chicago now is right, so where it really you can see it blossom in terms of how we've surrounded everything by the winemaking and you're really feeling like you're in the middle of a, of a of in wine country. So New York opens up in 2008. Yep. Chicago opens up when? It was a year and a half ago, so uh, middle of 2012. Were you making wine also, doing the same We're making same wine, idea. yep. Next April, Napa. Napa. But you're not going to make wine because there's enough wine in, in Napa. A lot, lot of great winemakers. Okay, there. and then Nashville. Nashville at the end of this year. Okay. So okay. You, you met this woman many years ago. You moved to New York to be with her, and you're married to this woman, yep. correct? And got two twin boys, 15, and a 10-year-old daughter. And what are the boys' names? Zachary and Eli, and then Sophia. Okay, talk to me about the uh, Passover Seder, which will be celebrating its 13th anniversary. Yeah, the, it will be having its bar mitzvah. Um, basically, back at the Knitting Factory, I wanted to do a Passover Seder at, on the actual holiday day for musicians. Um, but, then, and we, but we didn't serve food at the, back in the Knitting Factory day, so I wanted to figure out a way to cover the cost of the food. So we ended up selling just a few tickets to this artistic event. It was such a success I started doing a bunch of them and then realized you know we shouldn't do them on Passover if the public is coming because they want to be with their families for the actual holiday. So it's pre Let's do it a few days before Passover and then it's evolved and I've done them now at the, the, the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I did it at Lincoln Center one year but it's always challenging bringing a caterer together and, and sound and lights and all. So I, I, I don't think you have the problem with the making the wine because you make kosher now the now the wine is easy I still like to bring in a little bit of Herzog's wine just because I like them a lot and thank God for Grandpa Saul thank God for the you know the the, the, the capability of being a um, you know you know the sculpturer uh, the rec room guy to the flea markets to the knitting factory to the fourth city winery to be the vineyard of New York City which there aren't really too many and thanks for being here today. That was my pleasure. Thanks for having me.